Welcome to the Gospel for Planet Earth podcast. I'm your host, Carl Gessler, here to help you discover God's purpose for you and for the world that you live in. Today we're going to be hearing an exciting uh, testimony. Uh, you know, every testimony is exciting if it's a real testimony of the work of Jesus, because Jesus is exciting. Uh, today, George Carneal is going to be sharing his story, um, and George is is another miracle, someone that has been through hell and back, and uh, now he's walking, uh, walking with Jesus, and he testifies to still, you know, there's still struggles. There, every every testimony we hear is a, a testimony that's in process. Sometimes even those testimonies, those those stories can get derailed, uh, which are a tragedy. And anytime we hear somebody's testimony, we should listen carefully and uh, celebrate what Jesus has done, and also think about how we can minister to this person or someone like it as we hear their story, because we all. Uh, need continual ministry, myself included. I've grown up in the best of atmospheres, not perfect, but an excellent Christian atmosphere. I live in a great Christian community. We have so much support. I am richly blessed. And as Jesus said, those who have received much, uh, much will be required. And I'm one of those people from which much is required. I'm happy to give it. Jesus is so good. And for him to come through me is the greatest treasure in the world. Um, But we're all in process, and we should remember that. Everybody you come in contact with is a ministry opportunity. Someone who needs to be listened to, someone needs to be prayed for, someone who needs to be encouraged, someone who needs to share uh, with you in your times of worship. Um, So I just encourage you to do that. All right, without further ado, we're going to listen now to uh, my interview with George Carneal and his story of going from queer to Christ. George Carneal, welcome to the Gospel for Planet Earth. Thank you for having me on the show. You bet. It's my pleasure. Um, we, I enjoyed listening to you last night. Uh, it's your, your, you have a book, actually, that I look forward to reading. I, haven't, um, I didn't know you had a book till last night, so... That's my excuse for not having read it before I interview you. Uh, but it's called From Queer to Christ. And uh, so that is, we know where we're going in this interview as far as that that's concerned. But um, one of the things that I always find interesting to know is the how. You know, how, do, how does someone decide that they're queer? And then how does someone who has decided that make such a change to come to Christ? So... Um, I'm just looking forward. I'd love for you to share your story with us today. I know that you um, you have some church background, so maybe you can start start with us. You know, who was Jesus to George as a young young person? Well, my father is a Southern Baptist minister, and I did grow up in the church, and I had a very loving and warm family. But the demands of my father's ministry really kept him from being home a lot. Now, when you say you were born into a Southern Baptist. Uh, were you in the South? Or? Oh yes. Okay, because <laughs> that's cha- you yeah. know Southern Baptist has moved around the <laughs> yeah. country, so it's not all Southern anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tennessee. Okay. So yeah, he was a called to be a pastor, and um, for me, I really believed in Jesus. I loved Jesus, and um, I remember giving my life to Christ around seven years of age. Um, but when I started in first grade. That's when I started to notice I had this attraction. There was a cute little blonde girl in my class, but there was also a very cute little brown-haired boy in my class. Hmm. And I really had strong feelings for him, and it was really weird. I didn't think anything about it. But as I went on through elementary school, I noticed that my feelings for boys was becoming more intensified, whereas with girls, it was just like, oh, she's cute, but there weren't. They weren't the same feelings. Hmm. But in the 70s, when people weren't talking about homosexuality, and you certainly didn't have celebrities coming out of the closet, I didn't know what it was. And it was only when boys would call me sissy, faggot, queer, and homo and stuff that I realized there's something about this that isn't positive. And I didn't know what those words meant. But then when I figured it out, I was even confused as to how are they able to identify something about me that I had yet to come to terms with myself. I just knew as I was going through school, I was finding myself a lot more attracted to boys. And I actually had, when I was in fifth grade, there was a fourth grade boy in my church. 
and I spent the night with him one night, and his mom let us take a bath together. And it turns out, later on, I found out he was gay, but even then, we were exploring each other. So I had an early... At, at what age was that? I was in fifth grade, and he was in fourth grade. And it, but it was in seventh grade that you said that you noticed this attraction? Oh, no, in first grade. Oh, first, first grade, yeah. okay. So it was kind of just progressing, but mm. when I was having the experience with this fellow boy from my church... It wasn't anything sexual as much as just explore, exploration, just mm. curious about another man or a boy's body, you know. But it's really set something in motion in me that really made me feel very comfortable with that. Mm. And I just, I think I just gravitated more toward that. But uh, as far as Jesus is concerned, I, I, I banked it all on him. Mm. You know? Do you remember what Jesus was like in your mind? <laughs> I didn't have any thoughts about him other than I guess you know he's loving and he's God's son and he's the way to heaven. Hmm. And I didn't know much more about that. I didn't know how to personalize him in terms of him having a relationship with me. Hmm. He seemed like a distant savior. Okay. You know, this again this is from the mindset of a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said your father's ministry demands kept him away a lot? Yeah, well because they the church is a lot of pastors know this. A lot of churches don't pay the pastors enough to even survive. And here my f father's trying to feed a wife and four kids. So he would often take part-time jobs uh, just to help supplement the income. Mm. And plus the, the demands of not only trying to pull together your sermons, and this was before the Internet, which, you know, you really had to do it from scratch. Mm. So now you can you just look it up and print off your yeah. someone else's sermon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, in addition to that, you know, when you've got the demands of the congregation, the sick, the lost, the dying, you know, he just was being pulled in a lot of different directions. So he wasn't home a lot. So for me, because I was already had a because I already had a disconnect with the boys in my school and I certainly wasn't getting any love from them. Thank God I had my two brothers. They kind of kept me, I think, from becoming just a full on little sissy, <laughs> a scaredy mm. boy. They'd at least make me go out and play in the woods, and we'd go to the pool, ride bikes, and do boy stuff. They were older brothers? Younger, yeah. Younger so brothers, I was the oldest, though. but okay. I was so shy and, and mm. really introverted, and, and but they really pulled me out of my shell to some degree. Mm. But because of the boys at school and because of my father not being around a lot, I think there was just something in me that was really missing, some kind of male affection or bonding. And I think it just set something in motion that would later be used by Satan or the enemy, as we call him, uh, that when I went into the gay life, it w that is what was going to become the snapping point, the, the turning point for mm -hmm. me. Because now I was going to start to get what I had longed for mm. uh, all those years of going to school and just being abused and bullied. So that attraction in, in school, um, when did, did you ever talk to anybody about that? Nope. And I didn't even think to go to a library and look up – because the school would have a library. Mm -hmm. I didn't even think to look up that subject as well. I th and I think I wouldn't have anyway had I thought about it was because I would have been terrified if someone had, saw, had seen me reading a book about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where to go or turn to or to talk to anyone. And what made it more difficult was the Christians in my life from the church and, and that were around my parents – you would often hear even your peers make very derogatory remarks about homosexuals. So I lived in this perpetual state of fear of people finding out I can't talk to anyone. I don't know who I can trust because a lot of Americans today don't realize. But back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, even in the 80s, it was very dangerous to come out. I mean, aside from the fact that your life could be destroyed, people have been murdered simply just because someone assumed them to be a homosexual. Mm. And this was this was a real fear that so many LGBT individuals, at least the older 50, 60, 70, 80 year old LGBT individuals understand when you come from a different period, because it's not so it wasn't so accepted and talked about by mm. back then. So that, that was a real genuine fear as well. You could have your life destroyed. You could be run out of town. It really was a genuine fear. So I lived in my head and lived under this fear and I was in constant turmoil because I had no one to talk to about it. So I couldn't process it. I could only process the craziness in my head, but it was a constant craziness. Mm. You know, just uh, this is just an aside, but um, with the current climate on uh, a cultural climate, 
uh, concerning homosexuality, which is really driven by our education and, and media, uh, is the situation better now for people practicing homosexuality? Do you think, are they in a better place to receive the gospel now than they were in the 60s and 70s and 80s? Or do you think it's more challenging? To receive the gospel. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, in one way, I think it's better because of the internet because I have, because you know, on my journey, I've had access to so many great pastors that I've been able to go back to and listen to from the 50s, 60s, and 70s and really hear that good old time gospel, mm -hmm. the way men used to preach when mm -hmm. they had guts and backbone. Yeah. Not this Joel Osteen, live your best life crap that's out there now. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, but on the flip side, you also have so much being thrown at you in terms of, oh, it's okay to be LGBT. And look at all the happy people that are doing it. Mm -hmm. And so you have the media and the Hollywood. Those, those machines are feeding a narrative in which they sanitize that life. And they're telling you, oh, yes, it's okay, and you can even change your gender. Mm -hmm. And you have a public school system behind it that is indoctrinating the kids. What you don't hear, and this is why they silence our voices, voices like mine, is that we're out there telling the truth of what the life is really like. Mm -hmm. So I try to reach those individuals before they go into that life to let them know at first it's going to be fun. Sin is fun for a season. It's going to be great. You're around people who accept you. Because for most who go into that life, they are, were usually the outcasts, the freaks, the losers, the geeks. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted them. But the LGBT community has it right. This is where the Christian church fails. The LGBT community will embrace all the mutts, mm -hmm. whereas the Christian church is so quick to condemn and kick the, the, those who don't belong out, or mm -hmm. you have to meet a certain standard. So when you have a community that accepts anyone, regardless of how broken you are or how freaky you are or just whatever it is, mm -hmm. There's this sense of family and camaraderie, and that's the attraction. But once you get pulled into it, then you start to realize the pitfalls of that life. And with mm -hmm. all of that comes the drugs, the alcohol, the promiscuity, the por porn, uh, addiction. Uh, there are so many things, the suicide, the depression, yeah, things that they don't talk about. So I know I'm, I probably jumped way ahead, but uh, when no, it comes okay. to the Internet, it's a, it's a catch. It's a mixed bag with me. I mm -hmm. think in some ways the Internet has been so awesome. But at the same time, but it could be awesome for parents who want to try to find out more information to better understand this issue if they really search mm -hmm. and listen to those who've come out of that life to understand what they're dealing with and what they're up against. And that's why their kids should listen to our voices as well. Right. Because yeah. Because you will not find any happiness in that life. And mm -hmm. if they tell you they are, they're lying. Right. Well, that's uh, – so the reason I ask is because, you know, I was raised in a, in a Christian homeschool family – um, you know, eighteen, nineteen. I would have been one of the ones. Um, I, um, you know, I might make fun with my friends. You know, about. Oh, I felt very threatened by homosexuality, and I still do. I feel like the whole. I feel like you know every all the sexual revolution of the '60s and everything that it's become, is is really like a shotgun aimed at, at everything that's good. Uh, so that's that's kind of you know, but still my. I didn't really know anybody that um, whose story I heard. You know, as I've, I've as I hear stories like yours and others, and I hear like the things that li led into that lifestyle, it gives me better understanding and grace. Um, but you know, what what our culture seems to have done now is they're tr attempting to lift the shame off the issue, uh, which hasn't actually happened. It feels like it has. Like people come out, you know, they're celebrated when they come out, but there's still shame. You don't really get rid of the shame that way. But I'm just curious, you know, if if um if our Christian culture has progressed or regressed in its approach to to um the the issue of homosexuality. I guess that's what I'm getting at. And I'll stop blathering in a minute. But David Wilkerson, who's one of those old time preachers, I think, that we miss. <laughs> he wrote a book, Parents on Trial, where he was very direct about homosexuality. And I think you would agree with a lot that he said there. Um, I feel like we're missing that. I, did, I guess I'm asking for your take on that, if, if that's... I think the church has regressed. regressed. I think we have 
we now just embrace anything and everything. Mm. We've allowed society to dictate to the church what you must accept. And if you don't, we'll make your life hell. Mm -hmm. And they've acquiesced and they're taking a back seat instead of them supposedly or doing what they're called to do. That's take charge and dictate to society. Right. Uh, the holy ways of God and the right way of living. And uh, the churches have just become cowardly. Yeah, and it's well, really I agree sad. with you there. Now, have this double mask and sit six feet apart, and we'll continue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you um, you went through high school. Um, you know, where was Jesus in this picture? You know, what did you do with those, those feelings? And... Uh, by the time I got to high school, I was really at the point of beyond bitterness, you know? And when I, I mentioned this last night, you know, when I would hear my father speak about Sodom and Gomorrah or any other pastors talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a real sore set point with me because I, I didn't know God's word because to me that was a place of condemnation and rejection, and I already was getting enough of that. So I feared reading God's word. I just thought, he hates me. He absolutely hates me, and he's getting ready to pounce on me. He hates you because of how you... Uh, feel or because what were you active sexually at that time that you would say like you obviously you were identifying with Sodom and Gomorrah H who told you that I just knew it was apparently he destroyed these two cities because of the homosexuals the sodomites and the perverts and although I wasn't really sexually active at that point I knew what my feelings were I had already come to terms with the fact that I really am attracted to guys so this was really bringing about a dilemma for me and I thought Man, I was mad at my dad for even speaking about it, and I told God I hated him. I was just tired of it, and I was sick and tired of the hypocrisy of Christians and their mean-spiritedness and the way that they would treat or talk about homosexuals. It was something I was starting to take really personally, and I was starting to really have to hard, harden my heart to all of that because I had already gone through enough bullying and shame and rejection with the kids that I was – for me, it was I was in survival mode, and I it was really I just had closed off everything and everyone. So, the word was really not going to penetrate as far as I was concerned because I was done. So, if God hates me, and that's what you guys are saying, then fine, I hate him, and I don't want anything to do with him. And I completely just turned myself off to anything with regard to God. But your dad, who was giving the sermon, he didn't know, did he? I don't think he did. He may have just been preaching. For the mere sake of just giving a sermon on Sodom and Gomorrah. So he may have suspected, but we didn't have that conversation yet. And I talk about it in the book that one night, he, either he or my mom left a book on the dining room table, on a coffee table, I believe it was. It was called Gay is Not Good. And, and everybody was out of the house. And I knew they left that there to send me a message. And I picked it up and I just threw it down. I was, I was done. Uh, as far as I was concerned... You won't accept me. I won't accept you. I was really starting to get very angry and hardened about this whole thing. It was I was hurting. I was really hurting. That's but I had no one to talk to. It's an interesting thing. To okay, so you're le leaving a book out, um, but you never had the conversation. It so. wasn't until we had moved to Florida, and I was around, I guess, nineteen. Um, he found some gay, dirty books under my mattress mm. in my bedroom, and uh, we had we had a conversation, but I don't think it was one he was comfortable with. And he just said, we're going to destroy those. Well, I took them and gave them to a friend to hold for me <laughs> until the storm passed by. Mm. Um, it was – I don't think he was comfortable with it. We just never had a real – heart to heart talk about it until we had I had eventually moved to Kentucky and one day I decided to come out to them mm -hmm. I'd already told my siblings and they were fine they still love me so I wanted to tell my mom and dad and the reason why I needed to do that was I was had already been threatened a few times by so-called Christians who were going to out me and try to destroy me and so for me coming out to my family not knowing what the repercussions would be at least if they knew and if we somehow could work through that no one could ever hold that over my head again. So being threatened like that as well was another motivation for me to come out and try to diffuse and to take the power away from them. These are the constant threats you live under, mm. at least back then. Mm -hmm. So many of the 50, 60, 70, 80-year-old gay men listening to this will completely understand what I'm saying. Mm. I guess the difference would have been is instead of um, someone threatening to blow the whistle on you, it would have helped for someone to say, 
what's going on, George? Tell me. Tell me about it. In hindsight, mm-hmm. I wish there had been good Christian men, or even women, but especially men, who were sensitive to the Holy Spirit and didn't have any of that macho crap, but they were, they truly had the heart of Christ and perhaps noticed something in me that wasn't right and perhaps tried to befriend me and say, look, I want you to know something. I don't know what's going on with you, but if you're struggling with depression, you know, throw a couple of things out there so you won't just hone in on the homosexuality, you know, drugs, alcohol, homosexuality, you know, whatever it is. Do out a slew of them. I just want you to know that if you ever need someone to talk to, you can always come to me. It will be confidential. You can trust me, but I want you to know you have a safe place to share what's on your heart, and I'll try to help you the best I can. I don't know what that would have done in my life if I had known I had an outlet to get this out of my head and talk to somebody about it. And especially in hindsight, if a Christian has sat down to me and instead of just beating us over the head like they do, this is what the Christian community will do. They beat the LGBT community over the head with God's word. They don't show anything loving or gracious about God or merciful. If a Christian has sat down to me and said, let me show you what God's word says about homosexuality. But hang on, because I'm going to give you some good news. So show me that. But then show me also the passages where God says he knows the number of hairs on my head. He formed me in the womb. He knew me. He wants to prosper us, not harm us. Things where I know that God is really personable, that he knows me. And then go into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where somebody puts the cross under the microscope and says, this is how much Jesus really loves you. Now, I'm going to get emotional now. But to see the compassion that Jesus had and how he died for all of us and how he didn't have an axe to grind with just homosexuals, that that the sin issue is what he has an issue with, but he loves you. He mm-hmm. really does love he you. He hates the sin, not the sinner. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Has somebody approached me in that manner? Who knows how it might have changed the course or the direction of my life? But because all I had heard was the negative, I just thought God is so, he's just vindictive and mean and ready to pounce on us. And I just never saw anything good about God. And it wasn't until I was coming out of the life, and I don't mean to jump ahead, but when God really started to dismantle that toxic foundation that had been laid and started to reveal reveal to me who he truly was. That has been a process in and of itself. It's almost like being deprogrammed from coming out of a cult. Mm -hmm. God has had to change my whole way of looking at him. So it has been an interesting journey, even with regard to my walk with God. But that's how I would say to any LGBT individual who feels like God hates you, you're not going to find anyone who loves you more and is so gracious and patient and merciful. And if you will stick with him, he's going to meet you where you are, help you with your baggage. And turn this around. He's going to reveal who he truly is. Mm. And it's an amazing process. Mm-hmm. So you, I remember you said last night, uh, as you were sharing your testimony, that when your dad was preaching on Sodom and Gomorrah, you, you said, you know, I'm done. I hate you. I hate I hate God. What? Where would you go from there? Well, I was still living at home then, but once... We had moved to Florida, and my dad was there for for a brief period, and he ended up going to Kentucky to pastor a church because he moved around a lot. And I stayed back in in Florida with a drag queen. I moved in with him and his partner. And as far as I was concerned, I was done with church and Christians. In fact, a, a a Christian friend of mine at church had gotten me tickets to an Ozzy Motley Crue concert. And we went down to the concert in Tampa, and there were Christians outside protesting. And thank God I wasn't driving, because at that time, I wanted to just mow them down. That's how much I hated Christians. And I'm not bragging about it. That's just how badly I was hurting, because to me, they were the enemy. Um, but being living with the drag queen, I was now away from family, away from church, had nothing to do with God, and I was fully immersed into the life at that time. I just went head just straight into it because now I was able to be around guys and get this affection and this love that I thought was love. I didn't realize it was just lust, but to have, um, try to fill that void that I didn't realize at the time wasn't going to be filled. That can only be done through Christ, but it's like you, you're like a rat on a wheel. You just keep going thinking I'm going to meet that right guy. Who's going to fill that void and take away all that pain. And so you, that's all you chase after. It's like the rat chasing the cheese. 
Were you doing drugs at the same mm-hmm. time? Yeah, I've gotten on drugs. Usually, how people describe that is something to take away the pain. Yeah, the drugs and the alcohol. It really was to medicate. Mm-hmm. And plus, I was so shy and introverted when I went into the life, and to even get on the dance floor was just very hard for me. I would always have to be full, and I'd have to get in the very back, and I was just so shy. But the drugs and the alcohol would help loosen me up. The liquid I, courage, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was really a process, but it really started to bring me out of my shell. But, you know, with that came a sex addiction because I was addicted to the rush, the high of sex with guys. Because when you're craving, missing something and you're craving it, even if that guy is only using you for a 10-minute romp in the sack, you'll take whatever you can because it's 10 minutes where I'm out of my head. And I'm getting something that I'm so desperately craving. Uh, And, of course, you use the drugs and the alcohol just to kind of medicate with that. But, uh, you know, eventually I I had just hit rock bottom to the point where I became a prostitute. And I was trying to earn money just to survive. And uh, within three years of going into that life, like I said, when I first went into it, it was the best feeling in the world. But within three years, I attempted suicide. I was just done with that life. And thank God he let me live. And it still would be another 22 years before I would get out of that life. That is a very long time. Mm-hmm. I regret that I lost that much time, not understanding that no peace will ever be found at the end of that gay rainbow. Mm. There's no pot of gold waiting for you. 22 years is a pretty uh, long experiment to just, to prove. You know, they say they're like repeating uh, in a science experiment. You You do the same thing and see if the same result happens you know that's pretty pretty accurate result there yeah i'm telling people now it's not worth it how did you survive 22 years of that well i was in it for 25 it was just 22 years after i had attempted suicide yeah. i already done three years um i was really i started to go on a spiritual path and i was living in los angeles now at this time and i had a boyfriend of seven years and we broke up i was in and out of church But it was hard because the churches weren't addressing the issue. And the one pastor that I did address, he had actually counseled a celebrity whose husband had come out as gay. And I thought, well, if anybody's going to understand, he will understand. It wasn't that he was dismissive. He prayed with me and gave me some ex-gay ministry, but that was it. So there was this constant, I'm still struggling with this issue. And so even when I would go to Sunday school class, I did, I had, there was this fear of being found out because I never knew how people would respond. Mm. And again, I don't want to be rejected. So you become an actor. It's not about being fake. It's just that you learn what parts to turn on and what you have to turn off. Mm-hmm. So you're one way at work, one way at church, and one way out in the gay scene. So there's this constant juggling balls, and you're kind of trying to keep everybody compartmentalized because you can't you can't let some people see – what your life is really like and you can't let let those in the gay community see that you have this so-called church life and you're trying to juggle all of this while trying to navigate through this maze of insanity you know Mm -hmm. and um so i went on this so because i really didn't want to be around christians i really went down the path of of spirituality like i would i spent a lot of time at a new age occult psychic bookstore and, this and this is how you survived that those twenty two years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just I spent hours. I'd go to psychics and have my tarot cards read, and you know looked into Hinduism and the occult and New Age teachings. And I had befriended a, a well known New Age author who is clairvoyant, and just spent some time with him. And it gave me some insight into that whole realm of things, you know, automatic writing and all of the stuff that comes with it. But we know that it's demonic. Uh, when a spirit takes control and they start giving you stuff and you lose control and doing automatic writing. So um, there were just a lot of things that I was learning in that, in these various world religions, but nothing could stick. I just couldn't still get any peace. They weren't really giving me the answers that I wanted. And especially when reincarnation would come up, that was depressing. I mean, my life sucked as it was. The thought of coming back and doing this over and over as if they say it like, oh, you get to come back and do this over and over and mm-hmm. over and over. That's, that's depressing. You know, I want to go jump in front of a bus. <laughs> I so I didn't care for the reincarnation part. You know, I didn't understand that in the occult, it's not about – I always thought that God was holding back. And I thought maybe going into the occult, I would get knowledge that God wasn't forthcoming with. Mm. But I didn't realize the occult is really more about manipulating 
certain exp- experiences or people through you know divination or um, casting spells and mm. stuff like that. There were just aspects of that that were interesting, but yet this is where having I think a Christian background and having given my life to Christ really came in. There was always something in me that there was a fine line. Even when I would see the Satanic Bible and I would go over to it and I would want to read it, my heart would just beat to the point of where it felt like it was going to explode. And I don't know if that was because of just the evil around it, if I was sensitive to that kind of energy, because I am sensitive to people and energy, or if it was God's way of saying, don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And I would have to walk away from it and my heartbeat would get back into a regular rhythm. So I just avoided it, you know. Mm. So... There were just some lines I wouldn't cross. Even I had a friend of mine who was in Wicca. Uh, she was teaching me how to do love spells, like if you wanted to cast a love spell on a guy to fall in love with you. And even though I had all of the necessary ingredients and the, and the items to do it, just something said, don't do it. Even when you go into New Age and you do the meditation and astral projection, I don't know if you know what that is, where you can meditate and just kind of leave your body and you can float and go to other places but what you're doing is you're opening yourself up to demonic um, influence and possession depending on if you know christ or not it's very dangerous but thank god i had the attention span of a two-year-old so i could never just sit long enough to quiet myself to do that kind of meditation but there were just fine lines of things where god was like don't do it. Just something in my spirit would not forbid me to cross a certain line. Mm. And I can look back on it now, and I really believe that God had a hand on me, had his hand on me and protecting me from so many other things that I could have easily gone down a road in which it would have brought about a lot more problems, especially from a, a demonic possession, oppression kind of being demonized, that mm. kind of thing. And I know a lot of people who listen may not believe in that, but there is a spiritual realm and there are even Satanists who will tell you that. So they can discount it all they want. Uh, there are plenty of Satanists out there who will tell you we do summon demons and we know how to use them to do our will and to attack people. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, if they don't want to believe it, that's fine. But it, it, there is a spiritual realm and it's just dangerous to mess in, mm-hmm. with that stuff. It might look like Portland. By the time you're done. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So just going through all of that and not finding the peace or the answers that I wanted, I just – it was almost like, oh, fine. I'll go back to church. You know, I was just so desperate at this point. I took a year and a half off from the gay life. I decided to go celibate. I wasn't going to go to the bars or do anything. And it was the first time I started to get my sanity back. Like hmm. I started to feel like uh, I'm – I don't know how to describe it. I felt like my mind was becoming more clearer now. Mm. And so I started taking a Bible study course. Were you still doing drugs at the time? No, I was off of drugs and alcohol Mm. by this time. I would occasionally drink, but it would just depress me. So I stopped even Mm. drinking alcohol. But one night I was watching TV, which I rarely ever do. And there was this commercial for a church who was holding a Bible study for the book of Genesis. And it really appealed to me, but it went off so quickly that I couldn't get the information. And I just said, well, Lord, if you want me to do that, have it come back on TV and I'll I'll go. Sure enough, it, I was watching TV again and it came back on and I got the information. Never saw the commercial ever air again. Mm. But I went to that church and I spent two years going through an, the beginner book for Genesis. Then I went through the more advanced study of Genesis. And then I went back and did the beginner again, just to maybe catch what I missed the first time. But there was something about that. I hungered for God's word. And it really, it was so great. I mean, I I was around Christians and they were very respectful and nice to me, but I wasn't overly warm and affectionate. Hi, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Give me my pastry and let me just sit down and I want to just learn. I just wanted to delve into God's word. Was it a more like a, uh, a a more intellectual approach that you felt safer reading the Bible? Cause I know you said mm-hmm. like you felt just condemned reading the Bible earlier. Was this more like it, it had more of an academic feel and you're just like, yeah, I guess yeah. so. You know, just understanding it from that standpoint and, and how they would tie it into other parts of God's word. Uh, it really just sent me on a hunger. Um, I, enjoy, I love the book of Genesis. It's mm. fascinating anyway. But um, but by that experience and being around Christians, it was God's way, I think, of getting my feet wet to slowly step back into what I consider the lion's den. Mm-hmm. And then through that, 
I would meet other Christians who would invite me to their church. Through that journey, uh, this one pastor, I went to this church and this pastor came in and, and filled in for a pastor on the second Sunday. And that pastor spoke about homosexuality, but he did it in a way where there was love and compassion in his heart. And the way that he spoke about it, it wasn't that he was firming it, but I would just broke down and started crying. And I nearly mowed this old lady down just to get to him because I was determined I was going to get to him first because I had to talk to him. Because <laughs> I felt like here's a pastor who has compassion. He didn't say, he didn't talk about this issue with venom hmm. in his heart um, and, and in his tone. And he invited me to a church, but it turned out it was going to eventually be a liberal church, a Baptist church that would have an LGBT class, which was really wonderful because now I could meet others who were struggling with the issue. But little did I know that the leaders and the teachers were going to be pushing it in the direction of it's OK to be gay. Mm. And sitting through that for as long as I did, uh, there was a moment where God really impressed upon my spirit deprogramming. And I got really excited because I thought God is deprogramming me of the lies of these conservative Christians who are just backwards and they don't know anything and they're just hateful and mean spirited. And God's going to help me to become at peace with being a homosexual. Mm. But little did I know God was using me to listen to all of those lies and he was going to deprogram me of those lies of the apostate liberal theologians pushing that gay is okay narrative. Yeah, because by the end that. of it, I was so I, I'm not even being dramatic when I say this. I would sit in my car and just cry all the time and just beat on the steering wheel. And before going in and out of church, I was so depressed and distraught because I didn't know what to think anymore. Because now I could go to God's word and I could hear it from the pro-liberal side and the, and the very conservative side. So I didn't know what to think. And I just told God, I was at, I was said at my wit's end and I just said, God, if you will give me peace about this, of being a homosexual... I, I'm going to trust you'll put a good Christian man in my life, and I want something solid and stable. But if this is wrong under all circumstances, and if you will help me to know it, I will trust you, and I will still follow you. Hmm. And he gave me my answer. And uh, I was sitting at, before a panel um, speaking, and this one gentleman just asked me out of the blue, and he said, where do you think God is really taking you on this journey? And Carl, it was just like God was – it was almost like God was like, now – Let's see what you have to say. And yeah, I knew you in my answer heart. answer the question he was saying. And I knew in my heart, yeah. no. And I just said to them, I said, I don't think that this is God's plan for my life and that it is wrong and I'm going to turn from this life and, and whatever. Hmm. You would have thought I stole somebody's kidneys. They lost their minds. They screamed and yelled and lesbians were mad. <laughs> just, it went downhill so fast. Wow. But I knew at that point. This church is not even safe for me. And I left it, turned turn my back on it, turned my back on that life. And I've been out for 13 years now, and I have no regrets. That is the irony of the American culture right now, that when you turn your back on that lifestyle and fully follow Jesus, you also turn your back on a church. Exactly. Wow. Isn't that you know? And, and uh, it's an interesting thing that you'd say that, though, because I have, um, on this podcast, I've talked a lot about deconstruction. And I've, uh, you know, I grew up in a great Christian home, you know, not, not perfect, nothing is, but I went through my own deconstruction where I was taking apart the things that I knew, uh, but I, I never rejected Jesus in that part. I was just taking it apart and trying to look at it and analyze, is this really the right part that fits here? And I still do this. I think this is, I think it's a good practice, but many times people go down that road and then they just... They start taking things apart, and then they never put it back together again. They just keep taking it apart till they deconstruct entirely into some kind of universalist. And I, in your what you just shared, what I heard is you were you were taking it apart, and God was helping you do that. And now He said, "Okay, you put it back together. Mm -hmm. How how do these pieces fit?" And you're like, "I did know, I do know how they fit." Yeah, yeah. That's a courageous decision. Yeah, and, and when he's breaking, dismantling all of that and all of the lies, I mean, that's really what infuriated me was the fact that because of in my childhood, with when Christian's giving you this narrative that God hates you, and had I been able to sit down and look at God's word from this perspective, you know, and this is what I tell my LGBT friends, those who still talk to me, 
God is, you know, like an earthly father will tell you or a mother will say, don't go play in the street or don't touch the hot stove or don't play with fire. And you know that they're doing it because they love you. Mm -hmm. That's what God's word is. When he's saying, don't do this and do this, it's because he really cares. He's your heavenly father. Mm -hmm. Once I was able to approach it from that perspective and get the chip off my shoulder and look at God from that perspective, I now understood why he would get angry all of the time, especially when the Israelites would turn to idolatry after all that he had done for them. Mm -hmm. How insulting. Mm -hmm. So once I really, it was almost like God helped me to see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I realized God is our biggest ally and how much he loves us. So, you know, even when he's saying don't mess with around with the occult and witchcraft and demonology and necromancy and all that stuff. I now understand why, because when you do, you open up those doorways for demonic either oppression or possession, mm -hmm. and they're going to wreak havoc in your life. And God is not doing it to be mean. He's not trying to keep us from having fun. It's just that there's a right way and a wrong way to go about how, how we live our lives, but also keeping God involved in our lives, trying to live a life of holiness, even though we're not perfect. That's where the grace comes in mm -hmm. and realizing that grace doesn't give us a license to trample all over that and to continue sinning, mm -hmm. which is what the liberal theologians and many of the the woke Christians will say, oh, we're under grace. You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And I knew a woman in a church in Los Angeles. She was sleeping with several men in the church and someone asked her, how did she justify it? And she said, oh, I'm under grace. This is how sad and pathetic the mm -hmm. churches have become. So we're not allowed to just do as we please. We are called to a higher standard. And it just really took some time for God to dismantle those lies and to help me just really understand his word and where he's coming from. Because we have to look at this from his perspective, mm -hmm. because he's a holy God. It seems to me, too, that you have come to, even if you maybe don't agree with everything, the way it was presented, that you've come to appreciate your own father's position mm -hmm. on things. And, and you told me that there has been reconciliation, which is really remarkable, because... You know, I've heard a lot of people's stories where that has never happened or has not happened yet. How did that happen for you? Was it was it you or was it him or was it both? I want Christians to understand kicking your child out of the house and disowning them is the worst thing you could do. I can't tell you the number of runaways that go to Los Angeles on a bus because their parents have disowned them. And when they get off that bus... The wolves are waiting to devour them, and most of them end up in prostitution and sex trafficking and other things. They they really have horrific lives. Keep your children close. I'm glad that my parents loved me no matter what, and my dad was like, I love you. I just don't accept this lifestyle, uh, and my mom too. She just wanted me to be happy, but <sighs> – the dilemma with so many LGBT people is that – or individuals is that they will cut their families off because there's a struggle. There is such an, an inner war going on, and when the families aren't on board with it, it's so personal. You feel like they're attacking you or rejecting you, and you already have been rejected enough to where you're hurting. And so for me, I cut my father off for four years, but as I was telling you last night, you know, when I was in, living in Florida and I was living with the drag queen, and then I had moved down to Fort Lauderdale for a little bit, there was one night where I was, I was really suicidal again. And my father just called me out of the blue and said, you need to come home. And I don't know if God just impressed upon his spirit to make that phone call, but I did it. And I went home. But it would still be about another year later when I would actually attempt suicide. But when I was in Los Angeles, there was one night in particular where I was actually contemplating suicide again. And I hadn't talked to him in four years. I'd pretty much cut my family off. And he just called me out of the blue and said, I don't know, you just had you on my mind. I just wanted to call and check on you. And I just broke down and sobbed. And I just needed him. I needed something because I just was at my breaking point. Mm. At, at that life, and even at that time, it would still be a probably another, I don't know, 10 years before I'd get out. Mm. But I was already starting on that descent. I even went to a Christian bookstore in Long Beach one night. And this is what really irks me when I think about it. The gentleman who walked over to me and I said to him, do you have any books on suicide? And I was really hoping to find it from a Christian perspective somewhere in there saying that, oh, if you commit suicide, you can go to heaven. Because I was going to then take my life. And instead of him saying, well, would you like to talk or, you know, you're not thinking about doing this, are you? He just said, oh, we don't have any books on that and turned around and walked off. 
And I just sat there on the floor and I just cried. And it was near closing time, so there wasn't anyone around. The store was practically empty. I just bawled my eyes out. I was so desperate for peace and I just didn't have it. Mm. And I wasn't close to God at that time because I wasn't back in church. There were just so many variables and things at play here. But when my father called, he just invited me to come visit him and I did. And that really was the beginning of starting to rebuild the relationship Mm. and trying to have civil conversations. What I would say to Christians especially is that for me and for so many of us, when you have a parent telling you that God doesn't condone this, that you need to leave that life, I'm not thinking, I wasn't thinking of it from a spiritual perspective. My father was thinking about it in terms of my soul and where I would spend eternity. I was only thinking of it in terms of I'm going to grow old and be alone. And for you to say that to me, that's really hurtful to me. Because what am I supposed to do? I don't have feel this feelings for a woman, but I'm going to have to leave this life and I'm going to grow old and be alone. You know, what options are there for me? And that was really just so heartbreaking. And it would send me into an immediate rage and then a spiral into just tears and then frustration and then depression, sadness, and then the suicidal thoughts would come again. Mm. So I want parents to understand when you're saying that to your child, try to put yourself in. In those shoes. So in other words, if I said to you, heterosexuality is wrong under all circumstances and you need to leave your wife and go be with a man. I mean, that's disgusting, I'm sure, for you to think about. But you've got to do that if you want to please God. And on top of that, you've got to be intimate with that man. And then you come to me and say to me, you know, George, I'm really struggling with this. I can't manufacture homosexual feelings. I am truly heterosexual. And I so callously say to you, well, then you love your sin too much. You don't love God. You don't care about pleasing him. And I'm just so dismissive of you and your feelings. That's what it's like for the LGBT individual who is truly struggling with this issue. I'm not talking about bisexuals or even the transgender issue. I'm talking about boys and girls who have their whole their whole life have known they were truly same-sex attracted and have never had sex with someone of the opposite sex. Even when I was in the life, I would have women approach me and say, you know, I'd like to see if I could change you. Now, that's a straight man's dream is to have sex with a woman with no strings attached. Mm -hmm. And I turned them down. I said, no, because it was never about the sex. You can't manufacture who you're attracted to. So I hope people will understand this is so much deeper than just a sexual act. So if they could look at it from that perspective and understand how you approach that individual, do it with more compassion and empathy. Try to put yourself in the shoes of that individual. And then as you are approaching them with this message, do it with so much love and just patience. Because it's difficult. The the difficult thing, I think, is that when most people hear that, they hear, um, don't be confrontational. Uh, You know, it, it ends up being like gay is okay by default you know what i'm saying like how that's how do you how would you approach someone in love and still speak the truth how do you know you're doing that well like david said last night you know you've got the christians who have the turn and burn message Mm -hmm. and god hates fags and then you've got the woke christians who just tell you do whatever you want you're under grace there's a happy medium i when i talk to my lgbt friends i can actually say to them There's nothing that I'm saying to you that I didn't have to figure out for myself and learn for myself. But this is what God had to reveal to me on my journey, that it is wrong under all circumstances. It is an abomination. But he loves us. And when you – for me, how the whole process really worked was when I started to go into counseling. And I had straight and gay counselors and Christian and not unbelievers and what have you. But everybody was respectful. They respected where I was on my journey. But when God gets a hold of you and the Holy Spirit, when you unlock the power of the Holy Spirit, when you give your life to Christ, I would start to ask the Holy Spirit to be a part of my counseling sessions. Mm-hmm. And it would be amazing how the counselor would start asking me things that I had forgotten about or hadn't thought of or the Holy Spirit would bring to mind things that I hadn't looked at. Mm-hmm. It really made my sessions more beneficial. Mm. And, and I had, it was so therapeutic to go through that because God was really working and exposing so much of the baggage that I had because at the end of the day, so many people who are in bondage, whatever that bondage is, it really is because of shame, rejection, trauma, rape, incest, abuse, physical, verbal, whatever it is. 
But when you get to the root core of what those issues are that's driving the behavior and you get healing with that, you'll see the behavior change. Mm -hmm. And that's really how it happened for me. Yeah. The reason why I uh, could easily walk away from that life after 25 years was because how much sex can you have? It wasn't filling the void. I got smart finally and said, you know what? This is not working. I'm not sure if, if God's going to work. I don't even know if that path's going to do anything, but I know this much. I've done this for 25 years, mm. and I'm sick of it. Mm. It has brought me nothing but heartache and pain. Mm. I have no peace in my life. I'm constantly depressed and suicidal. So I had no choice but to either give God another chance or take my life. Mm. I was really at the breaking point. And when I get, went into just really following Christ and completely submitting to him, and it took time. I had to, there was trial and error. You know, obviously, we have to learn as we grow. I was a baby uh, in Christ, but God was patient. Mm -hmm. But through that and through this journey, even when it got dark, because sometimes God will test you to see, well, when things get uncomfortable, are you going to run straight back into that life and, mm -hmm. and in, into those old habits that you know don't work? Or are you really going to trust me through this process? Mm -hmm. And so sticking with God, man, I'm so glad I stuck with it because once I came out on the other side of it, I have no desire for that life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a miserable life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, instead of calling it a happy medium, I think I'd just say the truth is a narrow way. Yeah. You know, that the truth... But uh, say it in love. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying the, the, the truth, it just as factually, is narrow. There's only one of them, and you can fall off either side pretty easily, but there's only one, and that's where the freedom is. And that's where we need to be every, – that's where everyone needs to be. When you mention the, the you know, wanting to mow down the, the protesters, it makes me think of the pro-life stuff that I've done. I've had people screaming in my face and saying, you're making my friends suicidal by being out here with these graphic images. And, you know, my answer to that was uh, – if I didn't believe that there's something called grace, I would I would agree with you. But we do. There is something called grace. There's forgiveness, um, and it's you know we live in a culture too that it's a celebrity culture. So if people are mad at you, you're a failure, mm -hmm. and Christians feel that. And so I guess the just the thing that I'd want to say, and I don't know if you agree with this. I, I think you would, but you just you have to. You have to do both. You have to speak the truth and then hold the line when when the crap starts flying at you, you know. And that's that's hard to do, but I think that's that's where the war is won, is is it not? Well, let me ask you this. It, you know, the way I approach it is this: if on Judgment Day my friends were standing with me before God, and off in the distance was hell, and they knew what their fate was. And as they are shrieking in terror, which is what I imagine they would, I couldn't imagine them turning to me and saying, why didn't you tell me? Mm -hmm. And that's why I tell them, because I know once I do, if they still reject the message, and if I were in that scenario of where I was standing before them, I would say, I did tell you. And I tried to warn you, and you wouldn't listen. Mm -hmm. And they have no one to blame but themselves, because God is merciful. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell, as you know. But if they want to go, as David said, you know, he'll honor uh, that request. And, um, and I don't want my friends to go. Many of them have dropped me, but those who still talk to me, they know I love them, and I never beat the dead horse. But when the opportunity arises, I still try to just say, hey, you know, if you thought about giving your life to Christ, and some of them will kid with me and make little comments and stuff, but um, I am burdened for them. And I really get put out with Christians who have the attitude of they're too far gone. Mm -hmm. No, no one is too far gone as long as they are breathing. Mm -hmm. While they are still breathing, don't you dare give up on that individual. Because prayer works and Christians have the power. And how dare you give up on them because God didn't give up on you. Mm -hmm. And I see the work that he's doing in the LGBT community, even in Satanism and in the occult and even in the porn industry. God, and even on death row, God is moving and he, he's in the, the saving business. You know, mm -hmm. sin is sin and deliverance is deliverance. And so as long as they are breathing, you keep praying for them. Never stop telling them the truth. Even if they don't change, it's not your job to change them. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that will work in their life mm -hmm. to do the work and to change them. That's God's problem, mm -hmm. not my problem. But I must, in love, tell my friends the truth. And even if they get mad and angry, I just tell them, look, 
when I die, I want to know that when you die as well, that I will get to spend eternity with you because I love you that much. I really do want to have that fellowship with mm -hmm. you. But if you choose to reject Christ, this will be it for us because I won't see you in eternity. I mean, it doesn't mean I cut off the friendship, but it also doesn't mean that I'm affirming the life. And it doesn't mean I'm going to the gay bars with them. I'm not going to gay parties. I'm not doing gay stuff. Mm -hmm. I can be a decent human being. Because that's what Jesus did with the woman at the well and the woman who was caught in adultery. He didn't say, go and sin no more, you filthy whore. He just said, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. And with the woman at the well, he was very patient with her. And in spite of her being snarky at first and, and all the sin and stuff that she had going on in her own life, Jesus was patient with her. Mm -hmm. And we see what happened as a result. So many people yeah. came to know Christ. I don't know where Christians get off with this attitude of, well, if you don't change now, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. It, it infuriates me. How dare you start having compassion and empathy and patience yeah. and pay, pray for these kids. Well, these the people. truth is the person that says they're too far gone may be further gone than the person they're speaking about. Yeah. Because how were you saved? You weren't saved because of what you did. Right. You were saved because of what was done for you. Mm -hmm. So, well, George, um, thank you for sharing your story. Right. I'm going to make your book available as a, well, is there a website or, uh, yeah, An email if, address or um, if my website is www.georgecarneal and that's C A R N as in Nancy E A L dot com. You'll find an email address there and uh, lots of other information, uh, even about the book, uh, a YouTube link to media interviews if you just want more information that way. Um, but especially if parents have LGBT kids and you're just at a loss as to how to help them, uh, feel free to reach out or just check out the resources I have on the website. And if you are in that life, this is what I want to say to any LGBT individual who's listening. I want you to know that everything that I've said today has been said in love. And I hope that you will just be honest about your own life. And if you can be honest and honestly say, yeah, I may have moments of joy in this life, but at the end of the day, I still don't have that real true peace. All I'm saying is, is if you've tried everything else, what do you have to lose by giving Jesus a chance? Because Jesus is the only way. All other religions require you to do the work, and you can't earn your salvation. Only Jesus did can give you that salvation, and he did the work on the cross. And hell is real. And there are so many people who will confirm that, who've had near-death experiences. And I'm just telling you to please stop listening to the world, to Hollywood, to the media, to the LGBT activists. Do your own research. Don't believe them. Don't believe me. It is your job and your responsibility to get in God's word and do the research for yourself and find out the truth. And I'm just asking you, please um, be encouraged to know that God loves you. And if God doesn't change your feelings to be attracted to someone of the opposite sex, that you know that celibacy is an option. And, and even Jesus was celibate and there was nothing deficient about him. But understand, Jesus is going to return soon. So the temporary pain or struggle that you're in, understand that it's going to be worth the eternal reward. And I just want to encourage you guys and gals to please uh, give your life to Christ and um, don't buy the lies of the uh, LGBT community and especially the lie that you can change your gender. You cannot. And there are plenty of people, both religious and non-religious, who have gone through the process and are on YouTube and other social media platforms warning that it didn't, not only did it not change their problems, it made things worse. So let's stop believing the lies and let's start trying to help people and have compassion. Amen. Thank you, George. If you would like to follow up with uh, George Carneal, you can visit his website, www.georgecarneal.com, and that is uh, G-E-O-R-G-E-C-A-R-N-E-A-L.com. -E -E the future is good because of Jesus.